Mr. Philip Ng is the CEO of private real estate firm Far East Organization. He is the son of the late Mr. Ng Teng Fong, who started Far East Organization in 1960. Mr. Ng, that's how he prefers to be called, or rather Philip, that's how he prefers to be called, exudes graciousness and class in person, reflecting a servant leader approach. Despite his wealth and high profile, he's amazingly down to earth. He's a Christian man in pursuit of a life worthy of his calling. And what amazes me the most is that he has publicly declared FI's organization to be a Christian enterprise. He's making a stand on values and he's committed to living it out. And so in this special edition of the Provident Conversation, Living the Good Life, I'm really grateful, honoured and excited to have a chat with Philip. So first of all, Philip, I just want to say thank you so much. I'm really grateful that you have given me time for this. I know you are a very busy man. So I just want to know that you know, I'm really grateful that you are spending this time having this conversation with me. I want to start first by talking about FIES organization. And I want to talk a little bit about the achievements of uh, FIES. There are a lot of achievements here and I can only really just rattle off a few. Well, Far East, the largest private property developer in Singapore, three listed entities, Far East Orchard Limited, Far East Hospitality Trust, Yo Hyap Singh Limited, also a sister company, uh, the Sino Group, one of the largest property developers in Hong Kong. And the company has developed 780 properties in Singapore, including those in Orchard Road. And well, Far is also the only developer in the world to win this uh, award, 12 FIA BCI Pre D Excellence Award, the highest honor in the international real estate scene. Best companies to work for in Asia between 2018 and 2020, five star employer of choice award Asia, best organization for championing human capital, distinguished award, go winner employee wellbeing award, uh, and leading business HR award purpose-driven category. So many awards which I really cannot read them all. How do you personally feel about all these achievements? Well, uh, thanks, uh, first of all, Chris, for your very kind words. I hope I can live up to them by the grace of God. And truly, it is by the grace of God that uh, we have been recognised mm. uh, in various categories like HR and in building and construction. Mm. Which is obviously our mainstay business. Mm. Really, it's truly the grace of God because the Lord has provided resources and people of uh, uh, like mindedness mm. and like spiritedness, um, Christians as well, right. that have come to our workplace and joined hands with me and my other colleagues to build uh, or, or rebuild Far mm. East. Um, as a Christian enterprise, we are building a business and a platform, if you like, that uh, is moulded in the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. I will pick up on that, on Far East being a Christian enterprise. I think that's really interesting. But, you know, what actually inspired me about these awards is that they are not just awards about the properties that you have developed, but really about people. I mean, there are awards on being the best organization to work for. And obviously, I think you put a lot of effort on the people in the company. So uh, tell us a little bit about Far East in that area. How big is Far East? I mean, how many staff uh, do you have uh, in total? Okay, in total. Um, we've got right now about 2,000 people at Far East organization itself uh, doing the um, real estate and hospitality business. That's, uh, that's uh, the, the main, uh, the, the core of our business. Right. Then we've got about 430 people that are doing food and beverage, um, restaurant business, right. fast food and so on. That's under a partnership mm. company that's called Commonwealth Concepts. And we, we don't actually run this operation ourselves. Right. Um, we have put 
some of our people into this operation, but it's helmed by another Christian businessman who is our partner, Andrew Kwan. So uh, I would say, therefore, there's uh, roughly around about 2,400 2, plus. Right. Uh, that doesn't include Yu Yap Singh. Yu Yap Singh has another um, 2,000 odd wow. people okay. in Singapore and Malaysia right. and various parts of uh, its business. So as a group, it's probably four to 5,000 yeah. people. Yeah. So I mean, you have to manage these people, of course, through your leaders. Um, maybe can you share with us uh, some of the challenges that you face by managing a company of this size? Um, well, I mean, clearly there are a lot of challenges if one um, looks at every part of the business and, and you know, you see the weaknesses, you look at numbers and so on. But I, that's not really my focus today. Okay. Yeah, my focus today is to emplace uh, first of all, or rather to embed the right values. That's the first thing. So as a Christian enterprise, we must be values-driven. Mm. We are purpose-driven by the purpose of our Lord. Mm. And that must come first. Of course, we hope that uh, as we journey, um, we can build a relationship with Jesus. Mm. Because for every Christian, right, it's not just the values of Christ mm. that we want to adopt and follow and, and, and adhere to. But it's the relationship with Christ. Mm. Now, in a Christian enterprise, it is more difficult because mm. not all our, though we are Christian enterprise, but we do not exclusively only have Christians. Mm. And that would come, that would need to come uh, at some point in time, uh, perhaps not to all the people, but we do hope that the Christians among us will have that relationship. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, and I really want to talk about this yeah. right now because not many companies out there will publicly declare that they are in a way faith-related or faith-linked, right? Because to make that declaration mean something, a lot of challenges, right? I mean, how do you actually do that? Um, how do you actually run a commercial enterprise mm. and yet call it uh, a Christian company, especially in a dog-eat-dog dog world in, the, in business. All right. Yeah. So actually, it's the easy solution. The, the easy diffi- solution? Mm, it's the easy solution because the difficult solution is to operate in the dog-eat-dog dog world <laughs> Monday to Saturday and then Sunday be repentant <laughs> about it and go to church and be a, a, a child of God. No. So I think the easy solution is to remove the barriers and to remove the compartments and decompartmentalize and walk and talk the values mm. every day and every day with Jesus, so right, to speak. Right, right. Yeah. So to me, that's the easy solution. So when I came out, yes, I, I, I thought about it uh, hard because it is not just about me but it is about all the people that work with me. Mm. And what do I, uh, you know, how do I point to Jesus yeah. in a way that doesn't stumble others? Mm. Because I could fall very short and then people would say, ah, you're a hypocrite mm. and I'll be doing the Lord a disservice. Mm. But I thought about it and I said, well, if I'm a Christian and I don't come out mm. and I can, then I'd be doing a disservice to the Lord. And of course, you know, with prayer, and the Lord has, has, has uh, given me that, that strength, you know. So it's, it's like in the Bible, mm. Moses tells uh, Joshua, and so does God, mm. be strong and courageous. Mm. And God tells Moses that too. So I think our walk, uh, for me, I mean, as a business person, is to be strong and courageous as a mm. business person who is a believer of Jesus Christ, mm. to be strong and courageous mm. in the walk. And so I've actually adopted an easy solution because I don't compartmentalize, I don't dichotomize, mm. and I can live my Christian values mm. without being schizophrenic. Yeah. So I'm just going to maybe dig a little bit deeper, if you don't mind, because uh, so that the people watching this really understand. Mm. 
right? When we say that Far East is a Christian enterprise, right? How is that expressed out on a day to day? I mean, most people be thinking like, oh, what do you mean by a Christian enterprise? Is it just the values are Christian, Bible based? Or no, you know, you come to work every morning, everybody before they start work, they open in a word of prayer, even if you are a free believer, you yes. do that. How is it being expressed out actually? Yeah. So this is the important part. How do we actually put uh, flesh into the uh, bones, so to speak? And that's something that's ongoing. Uh, first of all, it's about the values of Jesus mm. and the biblical values. values. Yeah. So what we uh, see to be Judeo-Christian principles, of course the Ten Commandments, the law, and uh, the gospel, mm. and of course, love. Because the, the, the message of Jesus is really love. First, love God mm. with all your heart, with all your uh, mind, or with all your soul, um, with your mind and your strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. And not just your neighbor, but your enemy as well. Right. And of course, the, the last commandment is to love one another right. as he loved uh, them. Uh, this was spoken to the disciples, but we, we take it as um, an addict to us as Christians as well. Mm. So we have to, to understand what love means. Mm. And in that, that very large space of love, as we are in business, operating in the marketplace, how do we love our yeah. employees? Yeah. Especially so if they underperform. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yes. So, if they underperform, we love them less. No, <laughs> okay. We love them by telling them the truth. Mm. And we hope that all managers can do that. But we have to uh, communicate, keep communicating, because it's not an easy right. thing for managers to manage by speaking the truth. But love and truth must come together. Mm. Love and grace must come together. Mm. So, these are things that we have to... Uh, not just embed, but also flesh out in our operating environment. Mm. Of course, we've got a company chaplain, we've got many Christians, but these are things that, uh, as, uh, as it is said, right, that many of these uh, principles and values are not just taught, but caught. caught. Yeah. Yeah. So, we have to show, first of all, grace to our employees, mm. to our partners, to our stakeholders, to customers, and love and truth. Mm. And how do you operationalize some of these things? It is difficult. Yes, it is. Because grace is actually born out of the spirit. Mm. And it is very difficult if you don't have the spirit of the Lord leading us to show grace. Mm. Some of us can because we are inspirited, mm. but many cannot. But again, if we were to be very prescriptive, and write it down and say these are the do's and the don'ts and the A to Z, mm. it wouldn't be grace. Mm. Yeah, because grace has to operate in an almost nebulous, fuzzy manner. Right. But we talk about grace all the time and we hope that they do catch it. So like with our customers, how do we show grace? To the, the non-performers, how do we show grace? Mm. Meaning that, okay, there are agreements, there are service agreements, and if you're a non-performer, you know, we, uh, we can give you notice, uh, a month, two months, and so on. But if you want to show grace, because sometimes people have difficulty, mm -hmm. then it may not be that one month. Mm -hmm. It may not be that two months or three months. It might be six months, mm -hmm. a year. Some of our people in our midst who were released because they couldn't perform, mm -hmm. we gave them a year. A because, year to find another job? Yeah, oh, wow. a year to find another job because sometimes it's not easy. They come in in a certain position mm. and uh, perhaps they are, they, are, they are paid more than they should be. Right. But uh, what happens is that uh, they don't fit in right. and they're not able to perform. And yet they want to find a job with that same kind of compensation. It's difficult. Mm. But we give them time because we also want them to go through that process of searching and discovering for themselves. And they must make that decision finally because while we've given them more time, 
they must ultimately make that decision to go in at a, maybe a lower level. Right. But we have to show that grace. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm just getting a bit of it because obviously there are a lot more things that you are doing. Mm. I would say that the, because of the stand that you make, there are definitely certain things uh, in the business world that you won't do. But there are things that you must do, right? Like, for example, giving appraisal, uh, telling the staff uh, where he or she has gone wrong. But I'm seeing that it's not so much what you are doing, it's rather how you approach um, in doing these things. Mm -hmm. In giving an appraisal, how do you be truthful but showing grace? And if you have to let someone uh, go, uh, the grace you show in... I mean, I've never heard of anybody giving like a 12 months in a way, notice period just so mm -hmm. that this person will find a job, no shaming, you know, and, and, and all that. So it's, I would say, definitely not easy. Um, can you remember any incidents at all? I know I didn't prep mm -hmm. you for this, but any mm -hmm. incidents at all whereby, you know, that stand is challenged? Anything at all that someone says that, you know, this is, mm, this yeah. is the right thing we are doing, you know, we should be doing this, but because of your, that stand on the Christian principle, say, no, we are not going to do this. Yeah. The, maybe it's just my company, the way that we operate. There are not many challenges. They seem to be quite happy, mm. uh, which is good, I think, in a sense that people um, understand and then they kind of obey or they, they get it and then right. move on. Uh, this doesn't mean that we have not had issues. Now, that's often got to do with um, bad communication between the manager and the employee. And so that's why we do stress to managers how important it mm. is to let people know how they're performing and to speak the truth. Mm. Because if we speak the truth and in love, then people will get it. Right. I, I, that's what I feel. Right. But yeah, there will be some situations from time to time. Now, when they do happen, again, we don't go into a tizzy and then do a big uh, investigation and see why that happened. Because we do operate with the, the, the knowledge that also whatever things that we want to do, mm. uh, this is a fallen world. Mm. It can't be so perfect. perfect yeah. It can't be so perfect. Yeah. Even as a Christian enterprise, we will have imperfection. And we have to understand that. Yeah. So that's also, you know, um, having the understanding that God gives us mm. the lens to see mm. the world. Because God created a perfect world, but it became an imperfect one. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's how we... Yeah, thanks for sharing. I mean, I can see that after a while, these values um, that are Christ-based and Bible-based somehow has become a culture of the company. And... Uh, it's one of the best way or best ways or maybe the best way to actually sort the marketplace. Because mm. when we want to sort, we want to basically influence. And once these uh, biblical values becomes a culture, effectively the marketplace is quote unquote sorted. I want to switch gear right now and sure. talk a little bit about uh, your personal life. Uh, that's a bit uh, sensitive, but well, we all know that, you know, um, despite your late father, um, mm. Mr. Ng Teng Pong's vast fortune and wealth, he actually had a reputation for leading a very frugal life. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere on the internet, and please tell me if it's untrue, <laughs> that, yeah. you know, he lived in the same house that he had lived for 30 years and used to take his own lunch on the airplanes, and I don't really understand why. Mm. Is this true of your, I mean, your, your dad and... How yeah. has it been for you in your growing up years? Yes. In terms of living with a lot of money. <laughs> in terms of living with a lot of money. Okay. So uh, the thing is that um, my, my, my father worked very hard. Um, undoubtedly, he had values of that um, migrant, um, the, the, the migrant, mindset. yeah, the migrant mindset and the migrant. Uh, class of uh, people that came to Singapore and pioneered mm. 
Singapore and pioneered many things in Singapore and and contributed to the nation building and contributed to community building and so on. So I think my, my, my father was blessed, of course, by the Lord. He didn't know the Lord all his, uh, well, I wouldn't say all his life. Most of his life, he didn't know the Lord. He believed that there was a creator God. Mm. He believed. At the end of his life, we feel that by the grace of God, he was touched. Um, but he did leave, he, he did li uh, live a uh, thrifty and frugal life because uh, his biggest, uh, well, he had a few big passions. One was food. And yeah, while he enjoyed, you know, uh, delicacies uh, like uh, Chinese delicacies, Cantonese particularly, that, mm -hmm. and that's why we went into Hong Kong or he went into Hong Kong because he enjoyed the food there so much. Uh, that's one of his big uh, passions that he uh, had in his life. The other was horse racing. Yeah, yeah he enjoyed you know, watching the horses run and of course uh, making a bet on the horses. He had a lot of horses. I mean, my, my father was perhaps a little, uh, what they would say, uh, obsessive compulsive, right? Because in the sense that, yeah, he just didn't have three or four horses. He had 60 <laughs> race horses at one point in time. Yeah. But, okay, so he did have his indulgences. It is true that he lived in the same house for, in fact, not just 30 years, 42 years, oh, wow. from 1968 to um, 1968 to year 2010 when he passed away. So that's 42 years. But uh, it was a big house. <laughs> so it's not as if it was... But still, he could have had a bigger house. house, built a bigger one. Uh, right? I yeah. think it's hard to find a bigger... To be, to be, to be okay. frank, uh, it's, it's hard to find a bigger piece of land than the land that, we, that our family home was on. It's a big piece of land. There are, there are one or two uh, larger houses. But of course, today, when you look at the new houses in Singapore, they are really big, big houses. I mean, they would be bigger than his house. But he didn't need all that much space because it became a bit of an emptiness because all of us, the children, grew up and we got married or we went and lived uh, on our own. Mm. So it was essentially him and my mother mm. and three maids. And um, my nephew uh, or nephews that came from Hong Kong to do national service. So that's why he lived in the uh, house, uh, yeah, same place for 30 or 42 mm. years. There's a bit of an urban legend there, I, I guess, to, to say that. And then, of course, there was this uh, thing that said that he brought his own uh, lunch on the plane, which actually the lunch was from a good restaurant in <laughs> Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> and you order it's uh, better than the fried rice. Food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think in that sense, uh, uh, it, but you know, these are all urban legends. Right, right, right. Sounds interesting and cute. Uh, but yes, it's true. My father didn't enjoy the plain food, food. as much. Um, you see, my father was diabetic and he was overweight. And my mother kept him on a pretty tight leash. So she didn't allow him to overindulge too much at home and so any opportunity that he had to eat more and better but like uh, on his plane uh, uh, trips or uh, when he's visiting sites you know he would mm. also visit our, our our development site and then he'll he'll buy uh, snacks and, right. and he had quite a big appetite yeah he, <laughs> I mean Besides all yeah. these indulgences, well, generally you say that he's frugal. Yes. But I know a lot of parents, right? We can be very frugal on ourselves. We stinge on ourselves. But then we spend a lot on our children. So mm. uh, was it like that for you in your growing up years? Yeah, I would say essentially my, my father was uh, very generous uh, to us uh, mm. children. He didn't actually put limits on what we actually had to well, my mother was the, the person that controlled us. So I think it was good. Uh, my, my mom was really the uh, person that ran the home. And she had rules for us. So, uh, but my father was always very generous with the children. Right. 
Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you another sensitive question. Sure. sure. Because you talk about living a values based life, mm. Christ centered, you know, and uh, all that. And I remember, you know, when you did a blurb for me for the book that I wrote. Thank you very much. And uh, when people knew that it was you, people commented, you mm. know, that, well, uh, Mr. Philip, mm, he's a rich man. Mm. And so for somebody with that kind of wealth, it's easy to say that, you know, everything is values-based. Mm. For people like us, we don't have a lot of money. You know, we have to do all these wrong things so that we can be promoted, <laughs> you can earn more money. It's easy for you because you have all the wealth. What do you say about that? Yes. Yeah, so the same point was actually put to me. I, uh, I was giving a morning a breakfast uh, talk, I guess, at uh, one of the marketplace gatherings organized by Hope Church. Ah, okay. And so I, I think a young man, I uh, don't know whether he stood up or it was uh, just... Uh, put through as a, as, a, as a piece of paper that uh, Pastor Jeff read out. But indeed, yes, the, there is this view that, yeah, uh, yeah I've, I, I have all the wealth that I need uh, on, or want. And so it's fine mm. to have that modality of values. And I cannot, I cannot uh, really rebuff that argument because I, I would not know if I didn't have the wealth. I couldn't say that, you know, yes. it would be different if I didn't have that wealth. But I can only say this, that I found the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. I searched for a long, long time for the meaning of life mm. and whether there was a God. And I did not, I knew there's God. I know there is a creator because I know that when I look at the world mm. and the order of creation, I see order because I did biology and so on. I see order. I, I once asked uh, an atheist um, ornithologist whether he saw order in the species of birds. And to my surprise, he said no. He's actually repudiating something which I think any biologist or any ornithologist or scientist would say that it's an order. And so I searched for God, but I didn't find him because I read a lot of uh, crazy nonsensical books until I did the Alpha course, mm. I came to know Jesus Christ. And I know deep, deep down, and not just deep down, but uh, my whole fabric, mm. that Jesus is mm. God. Mm. And Jesus is our Savior God, and uh, there is a s salvation plan mm. which defies mm. what people of our modern era would mm. think. Mm. How unbelievable it would be for them that God gives his life for us. Why would God do that? I mean, I know I asked you this question, yeah. but we all know that the Bible says that, you know, it's actually very difficult for a rich person to go to heaven. It's easier that for a camel yes. to enter into the hole of a needle, the eye of a needle, right? Yes. Because people who have not been there before, they don't realize that actually when you are wealthy and you are very powerful, mm. you will actually think you don't need God. Mm. Because you, can, you have everything, right? You, you can do anything that you want. You think that you are very powerful. And I think for you to come out publicly and say that you have searched and ultimately you realize that there is a God and that God is our Lord Jesus Christ. It's actually very inspiring because it takes a lot of humility and realization to say that I'm not powerful. I, I, I may have wealth, it will disappear, but ultimately, God is the most powerful and I need a God. Yes. So thank you for making that point because it's, uh, it's absolutely right. That at the end of the day, the one thing I can't dispute is that to me, I, I, I believe there is one true God mm. and I know Him mm. because I pray mm. daily and, and maybe more than uh, daily. Yeah. But uh, so, with that relationship with Christ, uh, it's not a, a situation of, you know, having chosen values over wealth. I still have my wealth, yeah. I mean, in that sense. But it's no longer my wealth, so to speak. 
it's what I do with it as a steward. Mm. It's a it's a different thinking um, that only Christians understand mm. well. But I guess for skeptical people looking at me, mm. yes, it's it's quite right. You know, that I, I it seems that I've chosen this, and I cannot rebuff this because I cannot put myself in a situation where I did not. But I can fully understand uh, what they are saying, that uh, there seems to be a choice. And at the end of the day, yeah, I think even for Christians, we do make that choice. We do make a choice of whether having come to believe mm. and having come to faith, right, are you going to act out your life uh, walking with the Lord? Mm. There's still a choice. So there are many choices down that road. So thanks for sharing that. So now that you have, I mean, you have the wealth, you have the fame, power, actually, do all these things make you happy? <laughs> well, obviously, uh, you see, I don't know about fame. Okay, I, 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 I'm, I must say, yes, if I were to look at, Singapore is a small place. 5.8 uh, people, let's say now, 5.8 million. Yeah. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, surely, yeah, one would say that I, I must be well in the, the, the top 1% or 0.1% or whatever it is. Mm. Um, so there's more wealth than I could possibly know what to do with. But it's not my wealth anymore because I will like everybody else, have to bid farewell to the world sometime. And as a steward, it is what I do with the resources that the Lord has mm. given me. Mm. And of course, you know, uh, like all uh, families in business, we have to do planning so that our children, they also have uh, the ability right. to build mm. and find purpose in their lives and I, of course you know my greatest desire is really for them to walk with the lord because that is what gives me meaning mm. and purpose and peace without jesus my life would be meaningless mm. without jesus my life would not be uh, at peace mm. i would not have peace right, right. yeah there'll be uh, constant worries yeah. but with jesus christ i have meaning i have purpose and I peace. So, can I say then that it is not really the wealth that makes you happy, but rather for you what the wealth can do, and that means using your wealth to enable that belief that you have uh, that makes you actually happy? Um, partly. Partly, I, okay. The, the, the call to be follower of Christ and to walk with Christ is a st story that unfolds uh, like a good thriller. Yeah, you never know when you turn the pages mm. what it is. So I, I, well, I have general kind of uh, idea of what I should do with the wealth that I've been bestowed with. I have a general idea, but I also think about it uh, in tandem with the business because it is only if we build a enterprise a christian enterprise that is worthy of the lord mm. that we can do more uh, not just in god's name mm. actually god really doesn't need us in that sense but we do it in the name of jesus we point to him and then we create a good working environment mm for our employees, mm. for the people who depend on us and who, people who also contribute to this and for our partners and our associates and our customers and so on. So it is something that we have to do because the Lord actually indicates to us that we will be eating and drinking and giving in, uh, given into marriage, right? Like the last days uh, of Noah and even Sodom and Gomorrah and so on in the last days. And we continue, we will do that until he returns. So, I mean, I'm uh, pushing a bit more and sure. asking whether you can share a little bit about what are some of the things you are using with your money 
mm. to enable your beliefs and your values? So, we want to give uh, to the community mm. that we are in because we feel that uh, it's part of giving back. Mm. It's not, it's not uh, corporate social responsibility. It's not to build an image mm. or to build a brand and so on. The brand is, 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 is really to be a Christian enterprise. So the brand has to have the elements of our Christian faith. And we do it because the Lord tells us not to forget the widows and the orphans and the aliens and the poor and the people who are left behind. Uh, we also want to support Christian ministries and support groups mm. around the region, mm. maybe in the world. So where we have surpluses, we want to be able to contribute to different causes. Um, there are apparently 30 or 40 million refugees right now in the world. There are also a lot of people who are really in dire poverty. Whatever wealth that we have, of course, is not going to be able to solve the world's Problem. But we hope that as long as we operate, we can continue to give. And giving with a willing heart, giving because we're called to do that uh, as, as, as Christians. And I hope that you know, my, my children will all be Christian right, right. stewards right. and they will do it and that they will also find meaning. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to ask you one last question. And yeah. It's the question that I ask all my guests in this series of conversations that I had. In their book called Repacking Your Bags, the author, uh, the authors Richard Leder and David Shapiro, they define the good life as living in the place that uh, you belong, with the people you love, doing the right work on purpose. Uh, living in the place where you belong, with the people you love, and doing the right work on purpose. What do you think about this definition? I think it's a pretty good definition. Uh, it's a pretty good definition, except that um, if we hark back to the words of uh, Jesus, right, mm. when he was asked by the, the uh, scribe, uh, or, or when the scribe or the young man called him good uh, teacher, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So, if we hark back to the words that only God is good, a good life must have God in it for me. Mm. But I, I, I think it's a good definition if you are in a very secular setting. Yeah. Uh, and that's not, that's not uh, my life, obviously, because I mm. found Jesus Christ. Mm. And I think that if I lost Jesus Christ, mm. whatever it is that I'm doing now, even if it's with people that I love and in the place that I belong. Mm. And I belong to this place simply because I was born here and doing uh, the work uh, with a purpose or doing it, you know, really as a shadow. But without Jesus in my life, mm. I wouldn't be li living a good life. Right. Yes. Yeah, so actually the purpose here can be pointing for people to Christ. Right. Right. I guess if that's the purpose, then everything makes sense, right? Living yeah. in the place that we belong with the people we love, yeah. doing the right work on purpose, and that purpose is to point people to Jesus, yes. the ultimate purpose of our life. Yes. So I just want to thank you so much uh, for doing this interview. I know I've asked some sensitive questions, mm. um, but I'm sure you know, people who are watching this, they will really be inspired. And uh, I mean, that's what we really want to do. We want to inspire people and want to point them to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you so much uh, once again for taking time uh, with me for this conversation. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So we have heard Philip shared about his life. I think it's not easy for a man like him who has everything that he needs in terms of wealth, Fame, he doesn't agree, but people know him and the power. But yet to choose to make this decision of living the values that are Bible-based. It is the life decision that he makes before he makes 
any other decision, not just financial decisions, but any other decisions that he makes, he makes it in alignment with his life decision. And that life decision is about following Jesus. So I hope you are as inspired as me. The one thing I've taken away from this conversation is that we all need to stand for something. Because if we don't stand for something, we will fall for anything. And that decision, we can see it very clearly from Mr. Philip Ng. So I hope you have enjoyed this series. Until the next episode, this is Christopher Tan from Providence. Thank you.